We started out with 182,556.45. We wrote an estimate for 438,539.43 and ended up at the end of the day at $405,916.30. And that is what I call winning in this game. Big huge win for episode number 10 of What's Wrong With This Insurance Estimate. Welcome to another episode of What's Wrong With This Insurance Estimate. This is a big huge episode huge milestone for me and for this channel episode number 10 today is may 1st 2019 and i've really been looking for a good project to use as the 10th edition of what's wrong with this insurance estimate i thought i had a good one the other day and it was a good one maybe i'll have to use that for episode number 11 But then this one came across yesterday. Been working on this project for a long time, and kaboom, finally got it, pulled off, got the report yesterday, checks on its way en route, and I absolutely couldn't think of a better project to use for this episode. So I'm going to start this episode like I start most of the rest. If you haven't watched those episodes episode one through nine in a playlist, which you can find by clicking here, if you're on YouTube. A full series, this being the 10th episode, please subscribe to the channel. So I'm gonna start this milestone edition with a question. The question that I ask on most of the other episodes, and that is, Are you just taking the insurance adjuster's word for it? Are you a contractor who just does the job for whatever they say that you should do the job for? Are you just working off of the the original insurance estimate? Is that how you're running your business? Well, if you are, that's why I've made this series. That's why I started making it, and that's why I'm still making it now. And it's dedicated to you because I found that so many young contractors and older contractors, when they call me, this is their situation. This is what they've been doing for the longest time. And I still have guys that contact me today and gals. And so this episode, if that's how you're running your business, is dedicated to you. It's a Tower Hill project, and if you're not familiar with this series, what I do is I cover the original starting insurance estimate in depth, and then I'll go through and show you the Xactimate estimate that I wrote, and then we'll follow up with the revised Tower Hill insurance estimate that we ended up with at the end of the day. And I'll explain to you how I got there, each part of the process. So these videos here are more of a deeper dive, and they tend to take a while. So I understand if you have to pause and come back to it at a later point in time, but it surely is worth it. And I definitely recommend going back to episode number one, which I started probably about two and a half years ago. And so you can see how things have evolved throughout that time period, because that really is one of the main things you need to focus on in the insurance restoration industry. As soon as you think you've got it, the industry shifts beneath your feet and you have to adapt and adjust your game plan to keep up with the way that the industry is changing. And so I believe that that's one of the things that that I've been successful at throughout the past 20 years in this industry. And since I've been making this series that is very evident so if you were to go back to episode one 
and go through to two, three, four, five, all the way up to this episode, you'll see the changes in my approach and the way that I structure my estimates. And there's a reason for that. And so I'm a numbers guy and I, I deal with lots and lots of insurance projects and I really focus on trends. I try to really pay attention to that so that when insurance companies change their tactics, I want to take note of that so that I can adjust my game plan and be a counter puncher and respond accordingly. And so that's what this is really about. And some of the later, more recent episodes, I also take a deeper dive and show you some of the photos on the project so that you can visualize the project as we go along. And I'm gonna do that on this one too. We're gonna to cover this starting from the beginning and we'll go through each part of it and I'll explain how we got to the very end. So it's a Tower Hill project. This is in Florida in Panama City. And this is the result of Hurricane Michael, which happened, I believe, in October and caused catastrophic, extensive damage throughout the Panama City and surrounding areas. And you know, this is, I believe, hurricane number 11 that I worked on in the aftermath of hurricanes throughout my career. And I can't recall another hurricane that had this extensive of damage. I mean, really, the, the wind speed, from what I hear, was in the neighborhood of 155, give or take. And you can really tell, I mean, just devastating damage as far as, you know, brick structures and, you know, the debris that was flying through the air at that wind speed and trees, you know, flying around. There's a lot of trees in Florida, believe it or not. But uh, the damage that it did to roofs is certainly one thing, but everything else as well, which you'll, you'll see a lot of that in this episode. So it turned that whole area into somewhat of a third world country. I mean, it, it really resembled a third world country. And even for months after, and even now, uh, those folks, they're really struggling to get back on their feet. And so if you know anyone that's, that lives in that area or that works in that area, you know, show them, show them your respect and that you're thinking of them because it, it really is hard in that, in that area. So let's get into this specific project here. My involvement started after the original insurance adjuster had already been there and inspected and had written this estimate and a check had been issued. And I'm a consultant. I'm a damage consultant, independent consultant. And my clients are mostly contractors. And that's the case here. So my client is a general contractor and was hired by the homeowner for this residential project to make all of the repairs for the build back, for the reconstruction. And so there was a mitigation company involved separate from him that had already been contracted and had come in and removed a lot of the wet items from the property. And again, at a later point for like a round two of mitigation, which we'll cover, came back in and did more mitigation. So my, my client is only handling the build back, the, the put back, the repair portion of the project, which we refer to as the reconstruction. And there was also a contents company involved that was there packing out all of the belongings in the home and getting it all out of the way, boxing it up, putting it into storage. And so when I first got there for my initial inspection, the contents company was actually there. There's like 20 people in the house boxing everything up. And you can see in the photos that will cover how the property looked at that point. You know, it had been mitigated somewhat, and I took a, a million photos. And then I came back at a later point in time after the mitigation re a company returned for a round two of mitigation, and they tore out a lot more from the property. So I did like a second inspection and more photos and revised my estimate accordingly. So now this estimate is huge, right? So it's, it's multiple floors on this, even though it's a residential project, it's pretty extensive. There's multiple floors on this job. And so usually with these episodes, I will dive into every item on the estimate. 
virtually almost all of the items on the estimate I cover in the in the episode but on this one I'm not going to do that and I think you can appreciate that <laughs> like I'll put you to sleep because it's just 45 pages even on the original estimate of just room after room after room I mean, there's tons of rooms closets hallways bathrooms I mean there's a lot in this house it took a long time to inspect measure you know and the estimate seemed like it would never ever end <laughs> and i'm sure that uh you can appreciate me not going through each and every item on this on this job i'd probably lose you halfway through this if i don't lose you anyway right because it's so extensive so here we go rear elevation is where they start and they start there i think because that's where the storm kind of came in it sits on the water as you'll see there's a rear porch back there and uh, they just have here to remove and replace a couple of columns, to seal and paint the columns, to remove and replace some fixtures, some floodlights, to repair some damaged brickwork, glasswork, uh, impact resistant glass, three square feet. And we, I think that they meant to put three windows, but they put three square feet. As you'll see, that's definitely not accurate. But uh, siding, vinyl, a little bit of that, corners, downspouts, doorknobs. Let's just keep on moving down here. We've got some decking, which was a rear deck out on the water. They also had a boathouse and a dock on this job, but that fell into some separate coverages, and I don't think it had anything to do with my clients. So girders, deck joists. So this is all of the deck work to basically remove and replace a deck that sits by the water. And then we have um, left elevation, gutters, hourly rate to come out and inspect some AC condensers and handlers, front elevation, shutters, window screen, glass, impact resistance. And so again, one square foot <laughs> of impact resistance. We know that that's not accurate. That's a mistake, but we have uh, ornamental fencing, 150 linear feet moving on through temporary repair roof and wall tarping dumpster general and post construction cleaning so those are like general labor hours and then we move on into the interior and this is where I'm going to scan through it a little bit faster but the main thing I want to point out is that this estimate when it was written did not reflect all of the mitigation that took place on the second round so they don't acknowledge a lot of the drywall and paneling for example that needs to be replaced in this initial estimate so that part is somewhat understandable but what's not understandable is that from, you'll see in this home it's much more of a higher end property and so the flooring for example is high end and, you know, the ITEL reports would later confirm that they were much more expensive than reflected in the estimate here, for example. So you have the wood flooring, just oak. And the other part of it is that this estimate, when you're looking at it, if you're familiar with Xactimate, which over 90% of insurance companies use, so State Farm, USAA, Nationwide, Safeco, Liberty Mutual, Allstate, right? All of these main insurance companies and not so main insurance companies, most of them use Xactimate, right? So when you're looking at this, you're thinking, okay, well, it's written with Xactimate, but it's not written with Xactimate. This is not Xactimate. It looks a lot like Xactimate, but there's a lot of differences. So you see these little sketches in line right here, these little boxes, these colored line item numbers, the way that the breakdowns of the rooms look with this gray sort of background area here, this is definitely not Xactimate, right? So you really need to make sure that what you're looking at is first Xactimate. And so th that's a big problem because this is actually written with a program called Symbility and no knock to Symbility, but I do just find that from a contractor standpoint, it's a disadvantage because the prices are much lower 
And also you'll notice that some of the wording of the items are somewhat different and that can get in the way of it sometimes because some of the items that are used in Xactimate are inclusive of certain things, uh, whereas in Symbility they're not and vice versa. So there are certainly major differences, but also the per unit pricing, right? And so the pricing for Xactimate updates every month. And I don't currently know how often Symbility updates, so I don't want to speak on that. I don't, uh, I'm not aware of how often their pricing changes, but I can speak on Xactimate. It changes every month. Okay, so somewhere around the first of the month, every month, the price changes. And the price for Panama City, that market, is different from, for example, the Orlando, Florida market, right? And so the May 2019 price list in Panama City is different from the May 2019 price list in Orlando, and then that changes every single month. And a lot of these items are commodities, right? Lumber and asphalt-based petroleum shingles, right? So a lot of these things, steel, aluminum, based on commodity, prices go up and down every day and certainly every month. But when a hurricane comes like this, the prices change dramatically. The labor, major, major shortage, major shortage on materials. And you would know if you were in the area, because again, going back to the third world reference, it's hard to move around. I mean, there's much more traffic coming into that area and less road space to travel on. But the traffic, the, the general traffic that comes in, you know, from all the contractors and everybody that's trying to service it and emergency responders is way more. And so as a result, the traffic is slow moving and there's not a lot of uh, utilities around. And it's not like you can just like pull off at a Starbucks to use the restroom. <laughs> it's a little more difficult. There are a Starbucks. They might have a, not have a sign, but I was able to find some Starbucks. So, you know, the pricing every month changes dramatically. And that's a major problem, too. So when you look at this estimate, it was written in November, the beginning of November. So even if it was an Xactimate price list, it would be severely short. And I believe that that's part of the advantage that insurance companies have by rushing to get those initial adjusters out. They get out there, inspect, issue a check quickly based on an estimate that was probably still in the October price list most, most of the time. For most of the original estimates I saw, they were written in October, the same month of the storm. The pricing that was reflected there did not reflect the fact that there was even a hurricane. Does that make sense? This here, it's when I look at it, I see its symbility, and I can see that that's a problem. And it's also a problem for when you're dealing with an adjuster and you're trying to submit your estimate and Xactimate, it can be a problem and it can get in the way, which is a perfect example of that in this episode, which we'll get into. Because we did an encounter that problem, and I'll show you how we got around that. But this is Symbility, you know, looking through it. I can see that. I know that there are problems. And so I know that the, you know, the pricing is different. The items are different. But we're looking at it. We have wood flooring, and that's part of the problem. But the other problem is that in this home, we have high-end paneling going throughout many of the rooms. Paneling, uh, judges paneling chair rail, you know, where they have baseboard, for example, or crown molding, they're just using a typical regular crown molding or a regular baseboard item, when in fact the baseboard on this project was multiple pieces, very, very wide and thick, same thing with the crown molding, and so you can't just use the items that they that they used here. They're missing high-end wallpaper, wallpaper border, and all the prep that's associated with that. Some of the rooms that they had on here had wood ceilings and they had drywall. You know, so it was sorely off. And so you could just uh, try and visualize that adjuster going out in this home where I believe there's 40 plus rooms, maybe even more than that, and maybe quite a bit more than that. I haven't really added them up. And he's probably tired and wore out, probably no power. 
and he's probably been beat to death in that environment, and he's just trying to do the best he can do. And I think that's a lot of times I try not to knock the adjusters too much because they're under a lot of pressure. They don't get a lot of their items approved. They get kicked back. They go through a lot of, of abuse on their end, which, which is probably a good reason for some of their crankiness that you might you may have encountered out there. But I think that they're under a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, and they're actually told and trained, you know, if you miss something, don't worry about it. We have cleanup teams for that. There's a supplementing process. But for whatever the reason, this guy missed a whole lot of items and a lot of inaccurate items. And as you go through it, if it was just one or two rooms, it might not be that big of a deal for you because it's it's not really adding up to that much as far as the bottom line. But ultimately, where I gain the most of my success is in the details, the tiny little details, the dollars and the cents. I require on any job that I'm ever involved in that first and foremost, I have to do that inspection and I have to make sure I see it with my own eyes and get my own documentation because I'm going to find items, those little details that will add up at the end of the day in a report that's more than 45 pages filled with details that add up into many, many thousands, which you'll see. So I'm just going to keep moving through here. We don't have any doors really in this project that I'm seeing. We don't have, you know, as you'll see, most of the property was gutted. And so like this kitchen here, it looks like they have a lot of items here. We've got cooktops and cabinets and flooring, et cetera, et cetera but they're missing a whole lot. I mean, the whole kitchen was gutted and you know, most of the house gutted. And so you have electrical that needs to take place. <laughs> you have duct work, you have tons and tons of plumbing, same thing for bathrooms. And so you, you'll just see like the crown molding, just they're just using a general basic item there for crown molding. I mean, they even, they even acknowledge a, a larger piece here but not throughout the home. It's mostly just crown molding, regular baseboard, regular paint. And they've got specialty paint, high-end wallpaper, which you'll see. But there's a lot of fixtures that are missing throughout. There's intercom systems. Just many, many, many tiny little details that added up along the way. And from here on out, and you're probably saying, dude, scan through this. You're putting me to sleep, right? And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of go a little faster and scan through so I can get to some of the how we did it, right? Some of the more bottom line. And I hate to do this and skim through anything, right? Because I want you to be able to see every part of it. So I'll just go let you kind of just keep, see a quick, quick, quick scan of anything. If you want to pause anything, feel free. But I want to get down to the end without a uh, one thing to note the roof my client not handling uh, he is also a home builder one of the things that i'm seeing on a lot of the projects that we're working on together is that the roofers came in and grabbed a lot of the roofs but he's benefiting because all of this stuff here you know everything aside from the roof is still there and people still need contractors to do all that work and it's certainly beneficial to have a contractor who specializes with the insurance process. But the roof, he was not handling. So you'll see that on the insurance part of things, but not on my estimate. Okay, so we can get to some of the summary here. You could just get an idea for how big this house is. It's like three floors and a loft. Pretty big deal. All right going all the way down. As far as residential projects, I think this is probably the biggest one I've been working on down in Florida from Hurricane Michael. I've worked on bigger ones from Irma down in the Miami area and in Orlando, but here's the summary here. There's the big number there, 182, 556, 45, which was 
the original total, the replacement cost value that Tower Hill started with. After this, I wrote my version of the estimate, but before I show you that, let's take a look at the job. So here's my folder that I have set up on it. Going into inspection results, I also use a drone, and I'll set up a drone folder here, and I'll place my video footage from the drone here. And so there's the house going out on the water here. And then I, from the video footage, I take screen grabs that I include into the PDF estimate report for the insurance company. So it starts with an overview of the property, with more close-up action. And I told the homeowner I would take some photos of his dock and his boathouse so that he could have that for his own records. But there's the rear of the property, the columns that were referenced in the insurance report. These columns are damaged, and this flat roof kind of mangled up underneath. Dormers tore up. So the storm kind of came in from the water side, most of the damage done on the back. Now, one of the things you'll see on this house, there are a ton of windows and doors. And so the high impact resistance, uh, resistant glass that they refer to, that is on the front and on the rear. And so why they said three square feet here and one in the front is beyond me. But we even have damage to the brick on the chimney here. You'd see up close that these columns aren't really attached they're not really supporting it this is all damaged there's water all soaked on the uh, plywood underneath and so here's the first set of photos that were taken as I mentioned before the second round of mitigation which I'll show you first. And then I came back and took another round of photos, which we'll cover next. So there's the wood ceiling I was telling you about and the high end uh, oak floor. They just completely missed this area over here. So none of these cabinets, and this is all gone after the next round, quite expensive, just totally missing. The bottom lower cabinets and the uppers, ice maker, you know, high-end countertop, all missing, this little bar area. They didn't even have in the sketches the correct measurements for the nook there where it's all placed. Just a ton of damage and a ton of discrepancies. And I'll just tell you, hundreds of thousands. And that's, that's a big deal. And so what if these people didn't know what to do, right? And what if they had no resources as far as... And you can obviously see from the property, they're one of the fortunate, fortunate ones. They have resources. They can hire an attorney. I'll just tell you, the client is a former attorney. So I'm sure he has the resources where he could go and make the insurance company, you know, do the right thing eventually. But litigation, having to use uh, public adjusters and having to use the appraisal process or AOCs and AOBs. I'm not knocking any of those avenues because I know they all have their place. But one of the things that would really discourage me about it is the time that it takes. And for some, that's perfectly worth it. The timing's worth it. And for every, every situation is unique and different. But the timing that it takes for those different avenues, from what I'm seeing, is that the insurance company goes right into the delay, de deny, defend mode, right? You could see that when I was there, mitigation was necessary because it was kind of raining in the building. But a lot of high-end fixtures that certainly weren't reflected in that initial insurance estimate. I'll just move on down a little faster. I think you're getting the idea you know, they didn't have any of this. 
this uh, built-in high-end bookcase, any of the paneling, the trim, the cabinets, the countertop, all that just completely missing from the estimate. Master bath. You could see the, the boxes from the contents company that was there, the packing company, pack out. These photos go on forever, but thank goodness that they do because later on, because the mitigation company came back and tore out so many items, and because they didn't do a very good job of their documentation, they sort of trapped the insurance company into the position to where they had to pay for all this mess, but they really couldn't justify why. They didn't have the right documentation or the evidence of why everything had to be removed. And beyond that, they also didn't have enough documentation about the grade of fixtures and cabinets and trim and you know the quality of the items that needed to go back in because the adjuster did a poor job of documentation and photographing and so did the mitigation company so it just happened to be fortunate as far as timing is concerned that I happened to be there and that I got all these photos like you know the subflooring here um, so it was it was pretty easy for me to go back and show the adjuster like, here's what it looked like before. And here's why my estimate has crown molding in it that reflects crown molding like this and wallpaper border and wallpaper, right? Like, none of these things were reflected in the original insurance estimate, nor were they reflected anymore on the project because you couldn't see them anymore. They were gone. They were ripped out. So I'll just skim through here. Shelving in closets, mist all the electrical mist. So when I go to any property to do any inspection, I'm going to inspect every room, closet, and hallway. And I think you can tell so far just from looking through this, this is where most of my money is found. Because if I can get there and see it and document it and get the photos, then it's gonna be reflected in my estimate, as you'll see, but also it's gonna help me for my approval with the insurance company, as you'll also see. All of this damage. All right, so here's some of the exterior. There's damage to the brick porch. Showing flashing. And also showing damage to the brick itself. There's a lot of damage on the actual brick, you know, from flying debris. I see this a lot. Like, I find this a lot, not only on hurricane claims, but on hail claims. I see where, you know, there could have been 20 people that walked by it and didn't see it. But especially on hurricane claims, because... You know, the wind speed at 155 mile an hour and projectile missiles pretty much flying through the air. You know, that's what these signs and trees and pieces of metal and pieces of wood resemble. It's like a missile flying through the air. You know, it's uh, very, very dangerous. And when they hit the building, you know, they can easily chip the brick, the soffit, the fascia, break windows and chip paint off of uh, stucco and uh, wood siding. And so these are things that you really need to look for and take your time and slow down on your inspections. And I would say that to adjusters too. If they weren't under so much pressure to get it done now, 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 and close it, close it, close it. And their money's on the line, right? And so I just think, you know, you're, you adjusters out there, you should be accountable not only to your license and wherever you're regulated and by the company that you're working for and being a good you know, face of that company, but also for the policyholder. 
I mean, don't they pay their premiums? Don't they deserve for you to slow down and take your time at their house? I mean, if it was your house, wouldn't you want them to slow down and take their time? And the same goes for you contractors, because knowing that the adjusters are not going to do their job properly and they're not going to catch it, then a lot of times you folks are the last one there in the gap. And so if you don't catch it, who's going to catch it? And so if they get mad and they hire an attorney, even the attorney is going to need the documentation, okay? If they hire a public adjuster, even the public adjuster is going to need correct documentation. So to all you attorneys and all you public adjusters <laughs> and you professionals, if you're not slowing down or if you're not hiring the right people or if you're not, you know, taking the necessary time in the details, then I submit to you that you're not taking good care of your of the policyholder either. So enough of that. I know that's not why you're here. This is what it looked like after the demo. Remember that area with the, the little bar area with the ice maker and the cabinets? Totally gone. By the way, this is somewhat fortunate for my client, the builder, the general contractor, because he doesn't have to explain why all that stuff is gone. Like he didn't have anything to do with that. That was a separate company, mitigation company. And so he doesn't have to explain why drywall needs to be included. Because as you can see, there's no drywall there. And so the insurance company in this position has no choice but to pay it. And by the way, the mitigation company was a vendor sent by the insurance company. So I hate to say it, but that's kind of what they get. <laughs> you know, the... the and no, that's not what they get. You know, the vendor uh, could have probably saved a lot of these items. And that's what they're supposed to get paid the big bucks to do. And who knows, you know, the fog of war in that environment. Not sure why they didn't make a better attempt. The insurance company was a little bothered by that. But there's nothing they could really do. They had to pay it. So from my position... It was very black and white, you know, just the items that are not there have to be put back in. And everything along the way that's going to be required to make that happen. So I'm going to go a little faster here. You can see most of the pictures that we saw from before. Most of the areas that we saw in the pictures from before are gutted. We now go into my estimate, and I have obviously made a copy of it here with some dummy information to protect the personal privacy of the client and the homeowner. So first and foremost, we have pressure cleaning, so temporary work. You know, pressure cleaning because there's so much debris, like grass and dirt stuck on the undersides of soffits and on windows and walkways. And so I found right away that all these properties I was looking at were a complete mess and the insurance company had no problem with paying for the cleaning. I mean, they had to. I think a lot of contractors miss that opportunity. You know, tarping and cleaning should be an instant way to raise cash in the beginning of a storm, the aftermath of a storm, because you can direct bill it to the insurance company and process those particular invoices pretty quickly. But also, that's a way in as far as earning the job, like, hey, we can tarp it right now and we can direct bill your insurance company and try to earn the opportunity to do business with you on the reconstruction project. So the rear, I put in here, let's remove and replace everything. By the way, when do you submit this estimate? If you don't know me very well, you always submit the estimate before the build, before you start building, you know, if you have to do mitigation and temporary, that's okay. But before you start doing roofing and start, you know, going through the house and putting back up insulation and drywall, before you do any of that, you go ahead and submit your version of the estimate to the insurance company. Now, in this particular case, they were so far off that what I actually did was I sent them the photo report only. So you'll see at the very end of this estimate, all of the photos are attached to the PDF report. So I sent them just the cover letter only and the photos 
And my email just basically said, look, you guys are missing so many items on this house. There's already been another round of mitigation. And it, I don't even know where to start because our role is we do whatever is prescribed by the insurance company. We perform all repairs that are prescribed by insurance company. That's what we are contracted to do. And I'm running into roadblocks pretty much right away, and I don't even know where to begin. So let me show you the photos, and please send somebody else out here so that we could take a look at this together. And that strategy in this particular instance worked. Sometimes, you know, episode number eight, I believe it was, was the same kind of situation with USAA, but their response was, okay, send us the estimate. And so I was forced at that point to go ahead and generate an estimate just to trigger that reinspection. In this particular case, the strategy worked. They triggered a reinspect. An independent insurance adjuster came out and met with me, and we were able to go from there, which I'll, and I'll discuss how that went after I finish going through this estimate here. But I started out knowing that this is not an invoice. This is a hypothetical situation. It's an estimate. And so I'm going to start out, if there's any question about anything, let's replace it. You know, if it's, if it's damaged, can it be repaired? Maybe let's replace it. So let's, let's let the insurance company come back and say, no, it doesn't have to be replaced. It can be repaired. Okay. So I put on there, let's remove and replace the columns. We're removing and replace the structural brick uh, that it sits on top of, the spotlights, the light fixtures. We are 20 hours of mason masonry work. You know, and sometimes I'll put in the square footage of brick veneer. But in this case, I had a particular strategy about that too. We're doing remove and replace beams, uh, the drip edge, siding, fascia, crown molding, basically everything back there, the sheathing, hot mop, roof, everything. Remove, replace it. There's a couple layers of sheathing. There's OSB and plywood. So you remove and replace whatever is there as far as the estimate's concerned. And prime and paint, keep moving them, try to move a little bit faster. But one of the big factors on this project, again, were those windows. And so rather than to go through and itemize the pricing on all windows and doors, because it's my belief that they all have to be replaced, there, there's a building code that re, in Florida that requires if they're all damaged, or if there's at least 25% damage, and, and all of the, the windows are not up to code, and at least 25% of them are damaged, then all of them have to be replaced and brought up to code. Now, that code is, uh, you know, it, it relies ultimately with the local building official who has the jurisdiction over that matter as, to, as far as whether or not they choose to enforce it. And if the insurance company wants to push back, then they could try to go find themselves a building official who will state that they're not going to require that. So as a matter of strategy, I didn't want to kill them <laughs> with the price in the beginning. So I opted to list the windows at zero, but acknowledge all of them. So on the front elevation, you know, there were 37 windows, seven doors, all must be replaced, prices to follow, okay? And the building code requirements are attached to the beginning of the images section in this estimate. And so my strategy was to say, look, let's open the door on that, no pun intended, but let's, let's get the door open, let's get you to apply coverage and acknowledge that they all have to be damaged, and it's easier for them to do that if they're not looking at a two hundred plus thousand dollar estimate, you know, in addition to where this estimate's going to end up for the windows and doors. I knew they were going to be extremely pricey. I also knew that the independent insurance adjuster would not care if it was somebody else's problem later, and there would be nothing for him to get that coverage applied. So the goal here was to get the coverage applied on the windows and doors by not shocking them with the price. So the doors, windows, all have to be replaced. So the dormer siding here, move a little bit faster for you, pull deck, following the same exact pattern 
that the original adjuster used, the same order. So whatever sections he started with, that's where I started, and I'm going to go in the same pattern. But as you'll notice, I'm using Xactimate. I don't care that they're using Symbility. I view Xactimate as being superior to Symbility as far as the accuracy of the market value for the items in the estimate. And based on experience with Tower Hill and other insurance companies who don't use Xactimate, I found that any adjuster worth their salt knows how to use Xactimate and typically they will be able to accept and acknowledge your Xactimate estimate. And that's the way that I'm going to stand. I'm, I'm going to require that they do that. Like I refuse to present the estimate in anything but Xactimate, knowing that that's the most accurate. And I've never had a problem with doing that, nor did I have a problem on this one. So I, I wrote the estimate, rewrote it, and Xactimate the same order as what the insurance company is using for all of the sections. Zero, zero on the windows and doors. Left elevation, masonry. Again, open item. So with the exception of the little bit of debris or the little bit of uh, masonry work that they started with, that they, they put in their estimate a little bit of masonry work on the front elevation. So I repeated that with just a general 20 hour, but knowing that there are many other hits, I could shock them with, hey, we got to replace all the brick veneer on this thing. No, let's get it, the coverage applied, get an open item, and then hit them later. So see, we want to take cash off the table as much as possible and as soon as possible. And all of these strategies work in conjunction and in accordance with the overall strategy of taking cash off the table as much as you can get it and as quickly as you can get it. You see, if there's a fight on masonry items and on windows items and doors, then it's just going to delay the payment. So heating, ventilation, and cooling, we're just going to open it up with getting a technician out to inspect everything, to attempt some repairs, and take it from there, knowing that it can't be repaired, but also knowing that if I put in for full replacement, they're not going to approve it right now. They're going to require that that information, that it can't be replaced, comes from a certified HVAC technician. So that's where I'm going to start. I already know that they're going to do that, so that's where I'm going to start. All right, more windows and doors, more masonry, right elevation, same thing, masonry, open item, windows, doors, open item. But I'm listing the amount, four windows on this elevation. I'm listing the number of windows and doors, but with no prices. Fencing, ornamental iron fencing, same pattern that they had. They acknowledge the chimney repair, same pattern. And then we get into the interior. Now this play area room was, was that room with the wood ceiling and the bar area, one of the rooms with the wood ceiling. And you know, they're missing motion detectors and you know, they're missing a lot. They're missing, in particular, there's a soundproof underlayment that used to be in this, in this house that the customers, I mean, they've had this house, I believe, for 30 plus years. And it's kind of the house where all their grandkids come to. They raise their kids in it. It was important for them to not have to be annoyed by the sound. So they actually soundproof uh, walls and floors in certain rooms. All of that was missing. The type of flooring was underrepresented, like we talked about before, but also the fact that all of the drywall on all of the walls had to be replaced, meaning it had to be uh, painted. We're missing blinds and door stops and drapery hardware, closet, much of the same. We're missing the cabinetry in that closet. Um, they, they called it a closet, but there's actually that bar area. Uh, the cabinetry, the, the built-in refrigerator, the ice maker, the granite countertop, the backsplash, angle stop valves, plumbing fixture supply lines, the sink, the faucet, 
the GFI outlets, they're missing quite a bit. Also to rewire all of these rooms, you can see as far as baseboard, I'm using four and a quarter inch hardwood, plus the base shoe, stain grade, cedar paneling, uh, rigid foam insulation board for some of the soundproofing. Those items, item after item after item, you can see add up in a hurry. One thing you might notice if you're familiar with Xactimate, you're not seeing the sketches above these rooms. And that's important here because a strategy that I opted for also was to use the adjuster's exact measurements. And of course, that was after I went and did the measurements and checked them out. There were a couple of discrepancies here and there, but I decided to use the adjuster's exact measurements to try to keep the synergy and the pathway for approval as easy as possible. Because if all of our measurements were gonna be all completely different, that would just complicate it even further. And we already had the complication of the fact that I'm using Xactimate and they're using Symbility. So I kind of could have gone the other way with that. I could have really you know, focused in and came up with my own sketch, or I could even have tried to reproduce their sketch, which is very, very difficult to do to make it exact. But I could have gone the other way and there could be some features and benefits to doing it the other way. But for this particular instance, I chose for this strategy. And again, one thing I always say is every single job is different. Every job calls for a unique strategy. And it's all really trial and error is how we learn. I'm a numbers guy. It's how I got to be where I'm at now. But experience has a lot to do with how I come to those determinations. But that's how I that's the decision that I took in this one, and I sure am glad I did, which I'll tell you more about as we go. All right, so hall closet, I'm just going to go on down. You get the idea. Well, I will slow down the kitchen. The wiring, all the electrical items, hanging light fixtures, high-end crown molding, Cabinetry was deluxe grade, premium grade, not standard grade cabinetry, <laughs> not standard grade uh, countertops, which were barely acknowledged in theirs. You know, all these items, there's a laundry chute, warming drawer, intercom stations, deluxe grade wood range hood. There's a lot more than what was reflected. Dishwasher, dishwasher connection in the original estimate, as you can see. Half bath, more of the same, right? Custom cabinets, backsplash, it all adds up. Sink faucets, angle stop valve, plumbing fixture supply line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the flooring, we have the underlayment, we have vapor barrier, flooring with waste, sand stain and finish the flooring, hardwood baseboard base shoe, Hardwood two-piece crown, two crown molding, stain and finish crown molding, stain and finish baseboard, chandelier, light fixture, bathroom ventilation fan, towel bar, towel ring, toilet paper holder, toilet, door stop, all of which we're missing. <laughs> we're going to prep for the wallpaper before we do it, right? In this room, the wallpaper was still there. Had to remove it, had to prep, had to replace it, all of which missing. Stunning. Dead space. Only called it that because they did. <laughs> Want to keep it, uh, keep the synergy going with the insurance estimate. Dining room, dining room, stairway. And this thing just, as you can see, goes on and on and on forever. 438 page report, most of that being the photos. But I'll try to go faster here for you. When I was redacting it, <laughs> taking out all the personal information, just checking and making sure I didn't leave any names or claim numbers in there. Just going through it took forever. <laughs> so I knew that doing this again on this video would be, you know, would put some folks to sleep if I didn't do it somewhat quick. So here, let me go up. All right, you can get to the bottom line here. So without the roof, 
I'm at 438.539. O&P, everything included. 400 and call it 439k. <laughs> that doesn't even include the roof. And as you can see, if you haven't seen my other episodes, I put in the codes individually showing what's required. And then after the code section, all images, all those photos that you've already seen now go into the PDF report, starting with the drone shots. going into the actual photos. And I started with the way that it looked before the demo, so just in order of the way I took them, chronologically, showing the way it looked before, and then showing the demo pictures after. Okay, but just to recap, for the estimate that I wrote minus the roof was 438,539,43. And now let's just go get into the revised Tower Hill estimate and let's see how well we did. Now, how did I get this estimate? Like one of the things for some of you seasoned pros out there that you might notice right away on this estimate, it's not symbility. It was written with Xactimate. Now, how did that happen, (laughs) right? How did we go from getting, you know, Tower Hill who can only write estimates with symbility, how did they write an estimate that was revised with Xactimate? So when I met with the adjuster, one of the first things he asked me for was the estimate. And I, of course, said, well, sir, you know, I've been working on an estimate and I have the framework of an estimate that's coming into place. However, we were hired to perform all repairs that have been prescribed by the claim. And so as of right now, you know, we looked at the original estimate and we're trying to follow the prescriptions there. And as you can see, just by looking at the project, you know, we're running into roadblocks all over the place. And that's why we sent in the photo report because we wanted to find out from you, from Tower Hill, what was going to be approved that needs to go into the estimate. And so that's really why I'm here. You know, you write up the prescription and we follow that prescription. So I'm here to get your marching orders, if you will. And so, okay, got it. And so that's why I'm here. I figured together, you know, we could roll up our sleeves and figure out, you know, what needs to get done to make this project come together for these homeowners. You know, and I figured maybe you could, you know, determine some of these things and, and come up with the answer that I'm looking for on, you know, what items need to go here or there, uh, you know, does, does electrical need to be done or does it not, right? And so I really wanted to leave that determination up to you and let you decide, you know, what is actually going to be approved, and then I'll put it into an estimate. Can you accept Xactimate estimates from me? Like, do you use Xactimate? Is there any way I could give you an ESX file? And that's where I always go with adjusters next at that point. So that same thing happened in episode number eight, the one I referenced before, where USAA sent out an adjuster and we met together. The difference there was that I knew he was using Xactimate. And so I can give him my ESX data file, the Xactimate data file, and he can take that file and plug it into his Xactimate and essentially just put his own letterhead on it and take credit for my work. (laughs) Does that make sense? I mean, that's kind of how the ESX data file works, if you're not familiar. It enables the adjuster to make changes and modify your work, your estimate, but then they can put their information on it. It's a way that saves them all of those hours and that week that it would take to do an estimate like this that it took me You know, and I could, on one hand, I could say, oh, heck no, I had to do the work, so you got to do it too. But I'm I'm the complete opposite. So I'm actually on a mission to do the adjuster's work for them because then I can get them to write the estimate exactly the way that I want the, the estimate written, right? And there's a couple of things, there's a couple of advantages 
to doing it that way. Uh, for example, some of the RFG versus DMO settings, um, they're not even going to catch those. So Xactimate, when you write an estimate for a roof, for example, Xactimate, the default setting for most roofing items, as you can see here, is actually the trade over here is DMO, which stands for demolition for the removal of this item. So it says removal here. So usually it starts out with remove and replace, and you can see it has RFG for the replacement item and DMO for the removal. Now you can see both of those combined. This item here comes out to 1688. Watch what happens when I change that to RFG. See, it changes that to 2068. So it's much different. It's much higher, it's, but it's more accurate because you're not going to use a demolition laborer to take off the roof, unless you do. Most people don't do it that way. Most people use the actual roofing contractor, the roofing installers that are going to install the roof. They use those same, that same crew to remove the roof. You can go through and Xactimate gives you the option of changing it to RFG to make it more accurate. And that's the way I always do it. And it's not just roofing. You know, people that hear about this subject, they're always hearing about the RFG versus DMO. But it's also any other item. The category for crown molding, the FNC right here, crown molding, I've changed it to CARP FNC where before it was DMO. You know, you, you can, it's the same for anything, fencing, insulation, drywall. And so I go through as a matter of habit, you know, as a matter of default for myself, any item in this entire estimate when it comes to the removal has been changed accordingly. And that's the correct way to do it. Even if Xactimate starts out the default setting that way, it doesn't make it correct. But whether it's right or it's wrong, the insurance companies, their internal directives, is not to do it that way, not to do it my way. But they will do it if they don't know they did it. <laughs> so I am getting them to do the right thing without knowing that they did the right thing. But again, they wrote the estimate. <laughs> I wrote it, but he put his name on it. And that's how I came out with this Xactimate estimate was he ultimately was able to accept my ESX file. He got approval from management for them to be able to use Xactimate on this deal. And so he took my ESX file, plugged it in, made some changes to try to keep me honest. I find that they always feel like they have to do that. But you can see some of the same footnotes that showed up in my estimate in italics show up exactly in his estimate. So you can see the overall pattern all of the items that I use, that's what he used in his estimates. And he did make some changes here and there to knock, knock me down some, but the final product is satisfactory. So let's go through it a little bit here. We have exterior, the pressure cleaning. You remember that footnote in the beginning? It's the same exact footnote. So it's his estimate, but written by me. <laughs> And I take pride in that. I really like it when, when that works out. So you have the front elevation, rear. Um, a lot of the items were the same, except for he did not agree that we had to go as far with the roofing. With um, Well, actually, he didn't agree to that, but then he, uh, he didn't agree with me when we were talking about it, but he ultimately did agree to it on the estimate. But he did not agree to some of the uh, reconstruction on the beam, you know, the, the, the larger items that I had in there. He didn't think that was necessary. And he's probably correct, but essentially we left it at no problem. Write it up how you're going to write it, because if we run into any trouble, we could always supplement it later. And that's true, because we're sending in the estimate before the build. Now, see, if we try to do that after the fact, we'd be stuck. But now we have them, you know, they've acknowledged it. But look at the windows and doors. They're there. Open item, zero, 37 windows, seven doors, our damaged prices to follow. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Remember the strategy about how we use the windows and doors? We did it that way so that we can get them to apply coverage. 
See, even though even though there's no dollar signs next to this, like no no no, uh, it's at zero right now. That's not a denial. That's coverage, baby. <laughs> he opened the door for all of the windows and doors. So they're all approved. It's just that the prices aren't reflected in this estimate, but it says that prices are to follow. So they'll be ready for those prices at a later time after we've already gotten the money off the table for this estimate. Dormer, siding, pool deck. Again, windows, doors, prices to follow. Same thing with the uh, HVAC technician to inspect five damaged condenser units. Lovely. Coverage, coverage, coverage. They apply the coverage. We do the rest. Fencing, chimney repair. See, and in the fencing, I noticed it's R&R. Same pricing. So as far as the uh, FEN versus DMO, it worked. Chimney repair, crawl space, duct work system, all of that approved. And then just about everything on the interior was approved. And there's a couple differences here and there. He ultimately did change the sketch a little bit, the original sketch that the original adjuster used. But all the wiring is there, all the electrical, the duct work, you know, all the plumbing, cabinetry, deluxe grade, deluxe grade, uh, baseboard, six inch hardwood, intricate detail, paint, stain, Dishwasher connection, dishwasher, a cabinetry full height, deluxe grade, granite top, range hood, <laughs> kitchen faucet, angle stop valves, plumbing fixture supply line, wood range, deluxe grade, warming drawer, built-in oven, intercom station, <laughs> laundry chute. All those items that we covered, from my estimate, are now showing up in the exact same order and the Tower Hill adjuster's estimate. Built-in fridge. See, that's a little bit different there. He, instead of calling that a closet, he corrected it and made it more accurate. Playroom. All the soundproofing um, items that I told you about, they're all here. And the flooring, uh, the rigid uh, foam stuff, and the walls for the other rooms are there. Rigid foam insulation board here. It's all there. <laughs> it is all there. And because you've already seen my estimate and you know that it's basically the same now, I'm not going to bore you with every last little page. I will scan like we did with mine. And we'll go all the way down to the bottom line where it matters the most. The part that I know you want to see the most, which is where did we get this thing to? How close to my 438,000, all the way down to the summary page where we can get the total. Almost there. I feel it coming. Bam. And there it is. 405,916 dollars and 32 cents. A good day at the office. I must say. Now you can see why we use this for episode number 10, Milestone Edition, hitting them in the mouth with this one. So to recap, we started out with 182,556.45. We wrote an estimate for 438,539.43. And ended up at the end of the day at $405,916.32. And that is what I call winning in this game. Big huge win for episode number 10 of What's Wrong with This Insurance Estimate. I hope you learned something from this one. We're going to return again for episode number 11. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Insurance Restoration Training, 
please comment below. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear about some projects that you've been working on. I want to hear questions that I might be able to answer, might be able to help you out with. I want to be able to give you solid advice in episodes like these. And also for my podcast, the Practitioner Podcast, which is available everywhere. If you haven't already, download that on your favorite device. And we'll catch you soon. So that's all for episode 10 of What's Wrong With This Insurance Estimate. Keep winning, my friends. Much love.